I'm very honored to be bringing you this Yamashoa program today. Um, huge thank you to Mr. Ben Stern and his daughter and the, uh, yes. <laughs> Um, it's an honor to have him as well as his daughter and the film producer and director Charlene Stern with us. Um, they'll be doing a Q&A session after the screening, so definitely be thinking about your questions as we're viewing the film. Um, also a huge thank you to um, Orly Renat for the introduction to the Stearns, as well as to Sarah and the team at Kahila for coordinating the screening today. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it off to Charlene. She'll give an introduction to the film, a little more background, and we'll take it from there. If you can turn off your cell phones, that would be great. Thank you. Good morning. So today here in the US, and nobody, nobody has a choice what time in the history of humanity we're born. Nobody has a choice in the circumstances that surround them in the time, the course of their lives. Today, we have a huge fight to build a wall to keep out people who are, are coming to flee um, violence and to make a better life for themselves. We have laws that are being thwarted, but laws to ban Muslims from coming in and immigrants from coming in. We have laws growing to harm gays and lesbians, transgender people, and their human rights. My father was 17 when his life changed forever. He was imprisoned. He was enslaved. He was beaten. He was shot at. He was whipped. And then he went on two death marches. You'll tell me if this film has a message for today. I wish it wasn't needed. I wish it wasn't relevant. I'm so honored by the JCC to invite us to screen this film for you this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Obviously, I couldn't at this time say much, too much, but my heart is overflowing to see, look at you guys, and realize that all my pain my suffering and the price I paid in my life, sacrifice, my family, murdered. I managed to save the fate that I was raised in and look forward, hopefully, and gratefully, thankful for all the people who helped me survive. But above all, I'm grateful that I managed to, with my wife, to raise a new family, stern family, to thankful to be able to tell and look at, looking at you all, I restored my hope for the future, that you will stand up whenever there's a wrong done, whenever there is a, a response needed. Don't sit back, don't be indifferent. That's the greatest sin for price that we paid in the Holocaust, the whole world was indifferent to the Jewish destruction. So you, I am so thankful and pleased I am 
appreciative, appreciative to look at you and say there is a great future for the us Jewish people. Thank you so much. We're, we're able to take a few questions or comments. Yeah, so just raise your hand if you have a question. I'll bring you the microphone. Great. All right, so first of all, I would like th to thank you so much for coming over here. It, is truly so touching um, to hear you speak here today in front of our school. Um, and my question is, is that the next generation won't be able to hear from Holocaust survivors. Um, what is a message or story that you would like us to pass on? Okay. The next generation right. won't, the next generation. My mic, it's please. right here. I can't hear. Okay. The next generation won't be able to hear directly from Holocaust survivors. What's a story or a message you want to pass on today? Well, uh, the final result is that a small amount of Holocaust survivors after the war. Most of them didn't want to speak about the Holocaust, and most American Jews didn't want to hear it because they were embarrassed, they were affected, they left spouses and they left offsprings and parents and grandparents, so they were hurt themselves that didn't want to hear it. So for the first generation, we were, we survivors couldn't speak out them. I started speaking in 1968 when Professor Botts in Chicago came out with the, the hawks of the 20th century, the Holocaust. And that's when I responded. I spoke at the University of in Chicago, and I asked a speaker as a living witness of what happened. And I've been speaking since, and I believe that that is one of the reasons that I'm at, in this age I still speak. I would also just add that is the reason. I made this film so that his voice could go out to the world after his lifetime. Another question? Thank you. Can you raise your hand again? Sorry. I want to okay. say it was Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, where Professor Butts published his book, The Hoax denying the existence of the Holocaust. My father called them, he lectured, and then he called me in California and said, Shar, you would have been proud nobody fell asleep. <laughs> Next. So one of the things we always associate when we talk about the Holocaust is we always say never again. Um, the what? When we talk about the Holocaust, we always say never again. Um, and as we've seen in terms of the rest of the world, that hasn't really panned out. Um, there's just genocide all over the world. There's genocide in Syria right now. So I'm really curious um, what you think we need to do to just assure that this doesn't happen to the Jewish people again. Because we can, we can focus on saying never again for everyone else, but how do we make sure that this doesn't happen to the Jewish people again? Wow. Great question. You know, we say never again. He wants to know, and genocide is still going on. What's your advice that it never happens to the Jewish people again? I must say, you are the next generation 
that you're going to carry the history of the Holocaust. I'm going to show you. This is, remember this. And I was so many times close to that. And yet I kept going with it because I had the hope that we'll survive and we'll be a free nation, Jewish minded people, and stick up for the, talk about the wrongs and bring up the wrongs and defend the wrongs, people. That is bringing out the Jewish faith moving forward. I would just like to add my biggest hope I've realized in these last few months where so many have joined together to protest what is happening in this country and in this world today. No people know better. It's in our DNA from the time of Pesach where we commemorate the coming out of Egypt having been slaves for 400 years. We know it is with joining for ourselves and for others that we have the best hope of preventing a future genocide for the Jewish people as well. Thank you. We'll pass it down. How has the Holocaust influenced your relationship with God and Judaism? In 10 words or less? <laughs> okay. How has the Holocaust influenced your relationship with God and Judaism? I must admit it was an on, off, and on relationship. I was raised in an ultra-Orthodox family. I attended Chede, Yeshiva, and then Zionism embraced me before the war, and I heard Zev Sabotinsky of the supposedly the fascist Jewish leader, Zev Sabotinsky was urging the Polish Jews to leave Poland to go to Palestine. And I heard that in 1935, I became a veterist. And I, during the years of ghetto and camp, I was look, still looking forward to a, a Jewish home. And I asked God, what, how can you accept the letter a million and a half Jewish children go up and smoke. I had a little nephew who was born in 1940 in the Warsaw Ghetto. I've been looking for them, for my sister and the nephew for till 2004, 2005 years. So still, I couldn't accept the fact that they're not alive. So we're looking for the future, we must, we must. And, and now I'm back to Judaism. I feel that it's some godly power that runs this sinful people of this world. Um, I'm just going to add that despite the fact of the loss of faith during the Holocaust, when another prisoner had smuggled a little prayer book into Auschwitz and asked my father to stand guard, he prayed every day, and my father stood guard to warn him if a, if a soldier or Nazi came close. After the war in the DP camp, all of a sudden, this man runs up to him screaming and crying and throws himself at my father and says, you saved me, you saved me. This was the man he protected so that when he couldn't pray, 
he protected this other man's ability to pray. And once I arrived to the United States, I became a, a member of the synagogue, the dues paying, and I must say my daughter was one of the first students for my family. <laughs> Next question. Don't test me. Okay. <laughs> Another question? I, I'm just going to, while the mic's getting there, I want to say that my father often says that in order to live his life and experience the joy and the kindness that's out here in life, he tabled the argument with God. He said he will take it up when he gets to heaven. And I don't know of anyone I've met who's willing to take bets against my father that he won't win that argument. Next. Um, okay, so recently in the US and globally, there's been a lot of discussion about refugees. Obviously, we're having um, the refugee crisis in Syria and surrounding areas. Um, and in the film, you talked a little bit about what it was like moving to Skokie after uh, the deported persons um, camps. And what lessons do you think we can take away from the situation with refugees during World War II and following directly after it that can be applied to some of the situations we're dealing with today? What lessons can you apply when you were a refugee coming to America that can be used today, advice to help be helpful for Syrian refugees today? Uh, we must reach out to them. And a kind word, reach out in a handshake and offer little or as much help you can it is so important. It gives, uh, it, it rebuilds the, the hope, the lights up the feeling of fighting the issue of being a refugee. It's a slow process, but the surrounding that makes the difference of acceptance or looking down or abusing him, that is wrong, that is definitely wrong. And I want you to know that in the beginning, I encountered that both sides. So I don't think, I can hold against them, but I rather think of the positive people who did reach out and help me. We have time for about one or two more questions. By the way, if you've never heard of the organization called HIAS, H-I-A-S, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. They gave my parents $5 each to start their life in America. And today, they are helping Syrian refugees, refugees from around the world, come to a place of freedom and be able to rebuild their lives. Um, you mentioned many times during the film uh, about kind of your will to, to keep going uh, during your experience in the Holocaust. And I'm just wondering, like, you know, what prompted that? What, what made you decide that you needed to keep going? Like, was it, you know, religion or the thought of family? And just, just, to, under, just to explain that would be okay. incredible. Dad, a number of times in the film you mentioned your will to keep going. Where did that come from? What? It was instilled in me as a little kid. I was seven, eight years old, and my grandmother paired me up with another eight-year-old boy, and we walked around the stores collecting and delivered once a month uh, a handout for a few pennies, 
at two rates at the, on a Thursday afternoon, we raised six, seven zlotes. We brought, brought it back to my grandmother, and she shopped and cooked, and we took in the food Friday, challah and some chicken soup and chicken to poor hungry people. That was my upbringing, and uh, I still practice that today. When I walk the street in Berkeley and I see needy people reaching out, I hand a dollar regardless. And it's instilled in me. And it's so important to have, to be generous when needed. What about the will to go on? The will. What gave you the will? My will was. It's more that I have found out till the end I had will to find family. And when I searched all Germany, all the big city communities, and I couldn't find no one, I had, we were eight brothers and one sister. One brother left to Palestine in 1934, and he was the only one who survived. At that time when I was uh, liberated, I was looking for family and I'm seeking family. But the hope was in me and I did not give up till, uh, until I went with Shalhevet, the Jewish uh, organization from uh, the Palo Alto surrounding. And we went to Poland, and we went to Warsaw Cemetery where I buried my father. Obviously, I couldn't find the grave. There was a mass grave, and that's when they all helped me say Kaddish to rebuild the hope. I've been continuously hopeful in Chicago and Scotia. I let the Holocaust Survivors Organization, Dr. Korchak Bnebrit, and we did a lot of good for the community and for Israel. I think we have time for one more question. Anyone? Moss, do you have comments? Yes. Okay. Oh, there you go. Um, in short, his parents told him to save himself, and he remembered that. He escaped to Russia. They cried. They wouldn't talk to him unless he left. Four months later, he talked to someone who came. How is my mother? How is the family? The young man told him they had been thrown out of their house and their business, and his mother was sick. So he went back through the Russian line, the German line, and the Polish line to get back to his family. But it was his family that meant everything. Yes? So you talked a little bit earlier about the Jewish homeland, and Would I was wondering. Say that a little louder. You talked a little bit earlier about the Jewish homeland. And I was wondering if you'd ever been to Israel and how was that experience for you? You talked about the Jewish homeland. Have you ever been to Israel and what was the experience like? Uh, I must tell you, I was 18 times to Israel from Chicago. 18 times. I went to visit my half-brother who left in 1934. And every time, the first time I went to Israel, I bowed down and kissed the ground. And every time I went, it was my home. That's what I felt at home. I'm a proud American citizen, but my inner wholeheartedly believe it's what I learned as a little kid about Israel and Yerushalayim 
and that I carry that belief regardless if I'm religious or not. But uh, Israel is still historically embedded in me. I think I've been there four or five times myself. And the first time I said to my dad, you went the wrong way. <laughs> but at the time, at the time, Eleanor Roosevelt came to the DP camp to speak and they were planning to go to Palestine. My father had connected to his brother. My mother had an aunt in Chicago. It was a Jewish soldier who was with Eleanor Roosevelt who took a slip of paper back to Chicago. It was printed in the Jewish newspaper. My family, the family saw my mother's name and screamed and cried that there was somebody from the family who made it. And so they sent the papers first. And that's why we're in America. OK, I think that's it on the questions. Yes, we're out of time. So if you can join me in a warm thank you for the Stearns.